Next, we have Dan Sorensen, and he is the director of the Language Center of the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, and he's been in that position for the past 10 years. Prior to that, he taught German in a post-secondary context in Indiana, Montana, Minnesota, and Connecticut for over 30 years. He has worked with technology to support the learning and teaching of languages for the past 25 years. During this time, he's conducted a large number of week-long and day-long workshops on technology use in higher education in general, and specifically for the teaching of languages. Brees was the principal investigator of the Proficiency Assessment for Curricular Enhancement or PACE project at the University of Minnesota, which is a four-year federal grant within the uh, Proficiency Institute, which is sponsored by the Language Flagship. And he continues to present and publish results of this initiative. He's also co-edited volumes on developing advanced speaking in post-secondary language programs on teacher language teacher education, excuse me, and on cultures and languages across the curriculum published as working papers by the Center of Advanced Research on Language Acquisition, or CARLA, at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Sonnenson, welcome. We are very happy to have you with us. Thank you uh, very much, Sarah. Um, I'm uh, here to talk to you a little bit about uh, copyright and creative commons. And as you might have gained, uh, gleaned from what Sarah was saying, um, I uh, am a language instructor um, and I've been using technology quite a bit in my language instruction uh, and am not at all um, a lawyer or a legal expert or um, a librarian. Um, I've had lots of experience with uh, thinking about and talking with people about copyright and creative commons sorts of things. Um, and just want to preface this, that whatever I say can't be taken to, to the court. <laughs> what I want to talk about um, today are um, sort of some definitions. What is, what is copyright? What does it cover or what does it not cover? What's the public domain? What are limitations on copyright? What is fair use? And... Uh, Talk a little bit about, sorry, talk a little bit about open licensing, which is um, dealing with the creative commons. So the big question really is, what can I and my students use? And um, the, the answer, the very definitive, uh, sorry, definitive answer is, it depends. And that basically means that, that we can talk about copyright forever. And sometimes we'll just never come up with a, a, an agreed upon uh, response. And to a great extent, if you're talking about using material that's copyright protected, um, it really becomes a matter of something that you're deciding that you're willing to take the chance on using it. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But before we get to that, let's, let's look at what copyright is. And the two documents in the United States that really focus primarily on copyright are the U.S. Code Title 17, which was uh, in 1976, and the TEACH Act, um, which is uh, from 2002. And um, the thing to be aware of in terms of copyright is that each country um, has its own um, set of laws uh, that deal with copyright and intellectual property. And um, um, based on a number of, uh, based on a couple of agreements, international agreements, um, what's, what we're operating under here in the United States is the copyright law that is effect in the United States uh, where we reside. Uh, regardless of the origin of the materials that we're talking about or that we're using. So what, what is copyright? This is from the copyright law, um, U.S. Code Title 17. It's basically original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Um, that's what's covered under copyright. Uh, original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So it's a tangible something. So examples for, uh, of what uh, a work of authorship is might be a literary work, a musical work, um, including any accompanying words, 
dramatic works, pantomimes, choreographic works, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works. So any original work of art primarily, motion pictures and any uh, other audiovisual works, sound recordings, and architectural works. One of the, um, one of the questions that uh, are often asked in a copyright seminar is how many of you, um, how many of you own a copyright? And we could ask that, but I, we won't take the time other than just to say that most people don't raise their hand. And um, the, the question is, have you ever taken a photograph? Um, have you ever um, recorded something? Um, if you have, you own the copyright to that. Uh, you don't need to register a copyright by, the, by dint of putting it into a tangible form you have created a work that you own the copyright to. And what does that mean? That means that you have the right to reproduce your work, to create derivative works based on that work, to distribute copies of the work, to perform the work, to display the work, and, um, um, and also in terms of recordings, uh, sound recordings to uh, perform the work. The, the um, uh, appropriate word here too is uh, publicly. So you have the right to do this, sorry, in a public forum. Um, let's take a look at this, for example. Here I have three pictures that I took of a coffee house in Vienna. And I wanna use these in my class or in my online course to get my students talking about the role of the coffee house in um, Viennese culture. Can I put them in my course and allow my students to use them as a backdrop to a role play record, uh, that they record online? Just quick, I don't know, do we have an opportunity to do a quick poll? Yes, no? Could have everyone type in the chat if they put in a yes or a no. I can just sort of monitor. It looks like most people are saying yes. And you would be, sorry, you would be right about that because I own the copyright to these images. I can do whatever I want with them. And um, so that's, that's pretty, pretty obvious. I own this, I can use it. When does copyright expire? Again, in the United States now, as of 1976, copyright expires 70 years after the death of the author or copyright holder. So um, if those pictures that I took I may have taken them 10 years ago, and it doesn't really matter when I took them. It only matters when, um, when I die. So 70 years after I die, that uh, those pictures might be uh, part of the public domain then. So public domain means that you can freely use or copy images or any work of art um, that is, um, it's no longer under, under copyright. In addition to um, current works that um, come into the public domain after the 70 years after the death of the author, in the United States, any work created prior to 1924 is now in the public domain. Um, and that is going to change now for each year. Um, as we move into 19 or 2020, it'll be, um, we will include 1924 as works that are in the public domain. Um, the second thing is that any work created by the U.S. government or employees of the U.S. government in the line of their work is in the public domain. So, for example, the, the recent Miller report is in the public domain. Uh, you can do anything you want with it in terms of making copies and distributing them to your students. Here's another example. <laughs> You ask students to find a picture of Leonardo's Mona Lisa, to copy the image and to place a copy of the image on a blog page. They should then write a description of this person in the target language, or they should invent a story about her and write the text on the blog post. Is that uh, something I can do without um, worrying about copyright? So we have some hesitation. Some people are saying no, some are saying yes, some are saying it depends. It's sort of a mixed bag. Boy, that it depends is terrific because that's, that's often your, your question or the, the answer to those questions. My feeling is, again, remember I'm not a lawyer, 
Um, but my feeling is that if I make, if I use a, um, a, a accurate reproduction of this image, um, I can do whatever I want with it because this image is 500 years old. Um, it's, it's clearly in the public domain. Um, and um, I should have the right to use it, uh, post it online, uh, do what I want with it, as long as it's an accurate reproduction of the original work. So I would say public domain on that. Here's another one. You ask students to find a nice close-up color photograph of Michelangelo's Moses sculpture. Download the photograph and place it on a web page where they will then add a text narrating the story of this figure. What do you think? Can they do that? So a few folks are typing in the chat now. We're seeing a lot of no's. A few yeses. A bit more no. Okay. Well, again, my feeling is this. The, the sculpture itself is in the public domain. It's really, if I wanted to make a one-to-one -one copy of the sculpture, I could do that. But the image is not 500 years old. The image is something that someone has taken and um, is, um, is uh, already an interpretation. It's a, new art, it's a new artwork, so to speak. And therefore, copyright would, uh, would probably apply to this, to this image. How about this? This, is, this kind of illustrates it, I think, fairly clearly. Here's an image of a painting by Vincent van Gogh. Uh, the painting itself uh, is an accurate reproduction of the painting. And uh, that's on the right. And I would, I would argue that that's in the public domain. Uh, the image on the left, however, boy, it's hard to say that there's an artistic interpretation of this, of this picture, but but it is. There's framing that's involved. There's lighting that's involved, and um, this image itself. <coughs> sorry, this image itself, although it's legal because it's taking a picture of a, um, a work in the public domain, is itself something that could be copyright protected. I would I would argue. Um, there are a couple of things that are worth knowing about that that. Probably, well, we'll see here. So uh, there's a limitation on copyright. Paragraph 110 of the Copyright Code says that face-to-face -face teaching in a classroom at a nonprofit institution using a legally obtained copy is um, something that copyright doesn't cover. So that um, copyright just doesn't come into, into play. For example, you could use a document camera to project the text of a poem or a song in a book that you have purchased. You can play a DVD that you've purchased, or you can play a song on a CD that you've purchased. You've legally obtained the copy, and you're using it for your class in a face-to-face -face teaching situation, if you are at a nonprofit institution. Um, I don't think this means that you can take the text of a poem and run off uh, 20 copies on a Xerox machine and count that as uh, working under paragraph 110 because um, you're making copies of the, of the, of the poem. And um, what you're doing under this paragraph really is, is you're showing a copy that you've legally purchased. So you're displaying it. You might hand it around, students could look at it. So it's fairly limited. It isn't as free as you think it might be. And as far as online teaching, it doesn't apply. So the other thing uh, to be aware of is that copyright doesn't protect um, things, uh, things such as ideas, procedures, process, system concepts, principles, and so on. So examples of this would be recipes or lists or titles or facts. Here we have three films all have the same name. The name itself or the title of the film is not something you can copyright protect. You might be able to, to uh, protect it by other means such as a trademark, but it doesn't fall under copyright. 
Okay, so you want to make copies of the U.S. Census report from 2010 to engage students in discussing differences in population among three major U.S. cities. In particular, the students should discuss the ethnic and heritage makeup of each city. How many copies can you legally make and distribute? So we have one answer, as many as you want. Um, let's see, we have less than 20. 20, unlimited, as many as you want. Plenty, one for each student. So a little bit of variation there. Okay, I, th I think my, my interpretation would be as many as you want. Uh, the, the work isn't protected under copyright, so you can make as many copies as you, as you can afford, basically. <laughs> um, all right, here we have um, uh, a Wiener Schnitzel. So, so some of the examples I'm going to be giving you now are going to be from, the, from uh, Vienna in Austria. So we want to talk about, let's say we're talking about Vienna, we want to talk about typical food that, um, that you can find in Vienna and Wiener Schnitzel is one of them. So here, let's look at how you might make a, v a Wiener Schnitzel. Can I copy this text and include it as a reading piece in my online course? So far we have everyone saying yes. Great, that's terrific because that certainly is the case. The image is something else again, but the, but the um, uh, ingredients to a recipe are, there's nothing really terribly, uh, it's not a creative artistic work. The schnitzel itself might be, but the recipe is not. Okay, here's another one. You've purchased a CD by Udo Lindenberg, who's a popular rock star in Germany, and you make an MP3 file of one of the songs to post in your online course for students to listen to and work with at home. Does this fall under the, one, the paragraph 110 exemption to copyright? Looks like it's a unanimous no. All right, great. That's right, because it's it's online, and um, and that it just if it's online, it's not face to face. So let's ask the question again. Then, can I do this in any other way? Can I can I still make a copy of a song and distribute it to my students uh, and have them work with that song on their own uh, online? Had a suggestion come in to link out to it. That's one thing you might do. If if it's available out there. A few folks there's suggested a YouTube link. So if there's a link to a song, a version of the song, maybe post it out on YouTube. All right. So we might think about YouTube. Um, Let's go back to that question. Can I and my students use this? And again, the answer is it depends. Um, we can talk about the YouTube case in just a minute. Um, but we're, we're now into the, into the area of fair use. And fair use is the kind of thing that um, we talk about a lot in education. Um, and what we mean by that is that, you know, we're doing something for uh, educational purposes and we want students to have access to this material in order to study it. And um, we, uh, we think it's, it's only fair that we can use this in order to, um, to enable the education of our students. And the fair use clause is a part of the copyright law in the United States. And what it does is it says um, uh, there are there are instances where you can take where you can use copyright protected works, um, and you need to make a justification for that. You need to be able to justify what you're using and why you're using it. And the 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 um, characteristics of your use are. Um, are uh, 
enumerated in the, in the law. And that's, and that's these four that you see here on screen. Um, so what is it being used for? What, what, so let's say, let's take that example of the song by Udo Lindbergh. Why am I using this song? Well, I'm using it because it's, I need to have my students listen to and develop their listening ability and that sort of thing. Um, what's the nature of the work? Well, the nature of the work here is it's, um, wow, wow, it's a, it's a commercial, uh, artistic work. Um, so what we might think about in terms of, of um, the nature of the work, we might think about, you know, going back to the, to the census. Um, let's say it's not a census, but it's a, just kind of, um, uh, it's not published by the U.S. government, but it's a report of what was found in the census that is a listing of facts that are in the census. That's less a matter, that's less an artistic kind of work than the song by Udo Lindbergh, for example. The amount of the work used. So if I take um, 20 seconds out of the, the song for students to focus on, let's say it's the, the chorus that I think is a really important thing for them to pay attention to. Um, that is probably something I can maybe justify under fair use because I'm not using the whole thing. And fourthly, the effect on the market value of the work used. So that if I um, make this work available to students, um, will it affect the ability of the artist to sell the um, more copies of the work? Um, so those are the sorts of things that you can that you need to think about when you want to think about fair use. And there's a really nice sorry there's a really nice tool um, uh, here at the University of Minnesota Libraries that I can point you to um, that uh, helps you think through fair use. So uh, the nice thing is it's, it's a tool that takes you through those four parts. For example, purpose and character of the use. On the left side, if you check these things off, it favors fair use, but on the right side, it doesn't. It kind of works against it. So in terms of the character of the use, I wanna use it for a commercial activity, weighs less in favor of using it than using it for an educational, scholarly, or research use. Um, Furthermore, then looking at the nature of the use, you've got um, whether it's a published source or a factional or nonfiction source is weighing for it. If it's unpublished or a creative artistic or fiction source, it's weighing against it. So this is a, this is a, a pretty handy tool that kind of helps you think through whether or not you can justify using um, material that is copyright protected. Um, and again, I think a song by Udo Lindenberg is indeed copyright protected. Here we have um, a couple more examples. So this here is uh, an example of uh, the third man. Again, we're back to our Vienna theme. And I have, I'm going to just play this for a second. It doesn't matter that you can't hear it. Um, well, you might be able to because it's on my speakers. But I've got a piece here that's three minutes long taken from um, a film that was uh, made in 1949. And it takes place on the Ferris wheel that you see a picture of here on the, on the right. Um, and I wanna use it to illustrate, um, well, just to show what this, you know, that, that, that films also make use of kind of these uh, landmarks in the city of Vienna and, and so on. Um, you can notice here that it's a YouTube video. And someone mentioned YouTube a minute ago that uh, you can, you can uh, link to a YouTube video to show something. My question here is uh, under, the, under the auspices of fair, fair use, I would think that this, that this um, film is copyright protected. So it doesn't fall under those categories of not copyright protected. Uh, such as a work by U.S. government, uh, um, it's not face-to-face -face teaching. It's not a copy that I've legally necessarily obtained. Um, so the question of fair use comes in. Can I use this three-minute segment? So the question is, first of all, what, why am I using it? Well, I want to use it for educational purposes. 
Uh, what kind of work is it? Well, it's an artistic work, so that kind of weighs against it. Um, how much of it am I using? Well, I'm only using a very small small segment of it. And finally, is this going to impact the, uh, the market? And probably not so much. Uh, in fact, uh, I could argue that um, if it gets people very interested in it, they may go out and try to find a copy themselves of the whole film. So, so again, that, that whole issue of weighing things, does, can you do this? Can you use this? And the answer very often is, it depends. Um, I've chosen to, <laughs> in this presentation, uh, based on the reasons that I, that I gave you. I'm, not, I'm using this now not for educational purposes, but to, well, basically I am, um, to kind of, to, for il illustrative purposes and so on. And again, I'm not showing the, I didn't show you more than eight seconds of it. Um, so back again, the, you know, these are the questions that we're asking uh, about works that are under copyright protection. So um, here are things you can do. Um, you can link directly to publicly available resources. Somebody mentioned before, why don't you send them out to see it themselves? So we're back to this, to this, sorry, we're back to this issue of, um, you know, that, that place where we have the nice big Ferris wheel. I can send them directly to the website uh, on the Vienna uh, Tourism website that gives them a nice text, gives them several pictures. Uh, you notice that the picture here is copyright protected. It has the copyright sign underneath it, uh, but it doesn't really, but it's a public website. And um, I can send them out there to look at and to uh, examine uh, this website. Likewise, um, I can send them to a website, uh, the same, it's actually the same site, where they talk about Wiener Schnitzel and uh, provide the entire, not only the, the ingredients, but also the whole recipe of how to, uh, how to make uh, Wiener Schnitzel. Again, these are publicly accessible websites that I that we can access um, as much as we as much as we like, really. Somebody again mentioned YouTube, and and what's what's really interesting about YouTube is that um, whether copyright, uh, I mean, most of the stuff that's up there, if you again, if you pretty if you put stuff up in, in YouTube, you still own the copyright to it if you've created it. However, your uh, user agreement that you have with YouTube uh, plays a significant role here. And that is that if you sign on to YouTube, all that nice little kind of small print on the, um, on the user agreement says that YouTube has the right to do anything it wants to with that material. And it also uh, says that other users of the service which is YouTube visitors have the right to do whatever they want to with stuff that you put up there. So in effect, we have a license to use YouTube materials, uh, even to embed them in our own uh, websites or in our, in our own online courses um, and not violate copyright because we have the license to do that. The thing again to keep in mind, however, is that you need to make sure that um, the piece, uh, the, the, the person that uploaded that material actually has the rights to do that. So if someone were to put up uh, the, the album of Udo Lindenberg's um, uh, music and I uh, embed that onto my own website, I'm not sure that the person that uploaded that material had the rights to do that. Um, so in a sense, then uh, that's, that's the question you have to ask yourself. Is this a legal um, copy that you're giving students access to? Um, with all of that sticky wicket stuff going on, the, uh, the great thing is that there's the opportunity to actually have um, licensed material that is licensed from the get-go. And we talked about Creative Commons. You talked about Creative Commons in the opening um, session of this course. Um, Creative Commons is a means of retaining. Uh, you, let's say I, I have those pictures of my, um, of my Vienna 
uh, coffee house. And I put them uh, online and I licensed them with a Creative Commons license. That basically means one, that um, uh, others have the right to use that material um, without asking my permission. It also means that I still own the copyright to that. I'm still the copyright holder. And what I do by issuing a Creative Commons license or a Wikimedia license um, is that I um, allow others to use my material that I've created. And there are a variety of, um, of options that are there. Let's take a quick look at the kinds of Creative Commons licenses that are out there. Again, this would probably be a review for most of, for most of you because you've talked about this already. Um, but they have, theoretically, they have six licenses that they've designed. Uh, the most basic one is the buy uh, license, which is the attribution. So um, if you, uh, you can license a work, you can license a work with the, um, just by simply saying, you know, I license this as a Creative Commons by um, license, uh, which means that people can use it, but they need to say where they got it. Um, you can do it with the um, um, with a buy license, so that you need attribution, and with the requirement that people that use it do anything with it, make copies of it, make derivative copies of it, play, use it in other sorts of things, also share what they have created with it. So that's the share alike license. Um, there's the no derivative works um, aspect, which means that you can use it, but you can't embed it in something else. You can't make something else out of it. Um, there's the non-commercial or um, so you can restrict it so that uh, student, uh, people can't use this in a commercial uh, setting or to make money out of it um, and so on. And um, so, here, for example, um, is a, uh, <laughs> a video on how to make Wiener Schnitzel. So again, I'm not going to necessarily um, play this uh, with, the, with the words, but um, this is a video that actually has been licensed with a Creative Commons license um, with do-it-yourself or DIY mit Fay um, showing us how to make Wiener Schnitzel. Again, this is something that I can easily embed into my uh, website or into my into my online course, and um, and give credit to Faye, who has created uh, this this work. A um, couple couple of more examples um, is the uh, here's again um, the the amusement park where that big Ferris wheel um, uh, is. Uh, there are many other sorts of rides and attractions there. And here's a picture um, that is, um, I found through the Creative Commons search um, that needed attribution. Uh, we'll talk about the attribution in just a second, uh, what the requirements are for that. Uh, one, other way, one other way of looking at things or finding materials uh, there are other sites out there that provide royalty-free images. So, for example, the one on the right here was found at a, a website called Pexels, pexels.com, uh, which uh, provides uh, a whole slew of images by current photographers um, who have made these images available uh, royalty-free. Um, so here, Simon, Simon Matzinger is the... Uh, photographer of this, uh, this image. Um, and I really, frankly, um, the interesting thing about the Pexels website is that there is no attribution required. That said, uh, to be academically honest, it's important to illustrate where, or at least show where you got, get material from. So I've added a caption there. One of the things that's uh, problematic, particularly if you want to, if you want to, if you're concerned about aesthetics, and uh, let's say, for example, um, I want to maintain um, my site in the target language uh, all the time, 
to constantly add a caption like we're doing here with this, um, this uh, prater on the left-hand side, to add a caption at the bottom, notice that half of that's in English. Uh, also the caption on the other one is particularly in English. Uh, one of the things you might, sorry, wanna, I'll go to the next one for a second because I'll come back. One of the things you might do is just simply uh, put, a, put a link at the bottom or just a very small text that might link to um, a list of the sources that you're using on your, on your website or on your presentation or what have you. And then you can come back to uh, where you were. Oop, I'm going to have trouble getting back, but I'll, I'll, I'll go back up there. So, um, so again, we're looking at uh, these various, these various uh, places where you might license materials. So Creative Commons, uh, again, I'll just click on that to, to give you a sense of, this is where I can look for images. Uh, if I look at Wiener Schnitzel, um, why well, look? That's the image that I found. And you notice here at the top, it's Creative Commons by attribution, not, um, I can't use this um, to make money and I'm um, obligated to uh, whatever I do with it can also be, um, uh, must also be a Creative Commons license of the same type. Um, when I click on this, uh, what I get, what I get here, what's really great about Creative Commons now, it used to be not so easy, but what's great about Creative Commons now is at the bottom, um, they, they give you the image attribution. So uh, this, this image has a title, it has an author, and the license that it's uh, licensed under. And I'm allowed to just simply click that to copy the text. And so that's now on my clipboard. I can go back to my PowerPoint or my presentation and just paste that in, or I can go back to my website and paste this in. In fact, they provide the HTML if you want to put it on a web page. Um, to go back here then, uh, what, what's important when you do an attribution, and here we have this, again, this image of the, the amusement park, is that you create is that you include four um, elements uh, the title so here the title is 1509013938 the author which is Taralbus the source so the source is basically a web link so if I click on that it'll take me to that image um, and the license uh, under which it's licensed that information is what Creative Commons recommends that you uh, include on any um, item that you have, uh, that you're implementing from the Creative Commons um, uh, collection. All right, so um, there are two sides, of course, to the Creative Commons uh, idea. One is to use material that's out there. The second is to license your own material. And uh, just, just for example, again, boy, um, going out to the Creative Commons site, it's really nice because you can, you can walk through um, how you can set up your license. So if I have, again, I've got my images that I have of the uh, Vienna Coffee House. So I, do I want the adaptations of my work to be shared? Sure, and oh, I also want them shared alike. And notice that as I click these things, down below the, um, the license icons change. So if I click yes, others need to share the work, that includes then that icon of share and share alike. Do I wanna use allow commercial uses of your work? Um, yeah, sure, why not? Um, or I copy this code and put this into my web page. So I either copy this text or I can copy this code and put it into uh, my web page. And if you look at um, if you look at this example from the um, uh, copyright um, site here at the uh, libraries at University of Minnesota, 
at the bottom of the page, at the bottom of each of these pages, they include exactly that text uh, from the Creative Commons site. So a derivative work is uh, based on or derived from one or more already existent works. Um, so examples are translations, musical arrangements, motion picture uh, uh, versions of literary materials or plays and so on. Um, to be copyrightable, a derivative work must incorporate some or all of a pre-existing work and add new original copyrightable authorship to that work. Um, So again, here's a list of possible um, uh, options that might be considered derivative works. But once again, let's let's take a look at you've you've downloaded an image file covered by a CC license. In order to make it fit onto your web page or presentation nicely, you need to resize it or perhaps crop it. Are you creating a derivative work? And you can go ahead and type in the chat your thoughts. Is this a derivative work if we resize or crop the image? Again, the answer is probably it depends. Um, I would say um, I haven't really changed it other than, than made it fit into a new context. Um, I, think a, I think a more, um, sort of egregious example might be the next one where, um, where I might take uh, images that I found on the internet and, um, and try to put them into a new creation. It seems to me that if, again, if the copyrightable uh, or if the license doesn't allow me to make a derivative copy of this and add new content to it or even um, expand on it, I'm probably not I'm probably risking viola uh, violating uh, the copyright uh, of the um, um, of the piece. Um, I think just sort of tying up. Um, basically, the usable sources I think that are that are uh, useful to think about are uh, works that you yourself have created, works that are in the public domain. Um, internet resources, that is to say, just send them out to public websites, uh, creative commons or openly licensed works. Um, and so those, those are all fairly straightforward, I think. And then the, the tricky one, uh, the sticky one really is the, um, the fair use one. Um, you need to think about the character of the use, the nature of the work uh, that you're trying to use, the amount of the work you used and the effect of the market value. Um, again, here are, this is what you might do by uh, putting a list of sources of the various um, uh, materials that you've used. And um, here's a list of sources, resources for further information. Um, I'm going to stop there um, and um, ask if there are any uh, things to talk about, any questions. Dan, we had a lot of really good questions come in and it's kind of difficult to keep up in the chat just because so many have come in and a lot of them are really specific, asking about cases where I want to do this in my course and X, Y, Z variables, is this okay for me to do? I feel like we do need to add that caveat in there again that we're not legal experts and we certainly can't give the perfect answers. Um, also keeping in mind that this presentation is geared a little bit more toward US copyright and there are definitely a lot of variations depending on where you may be in the world and also where these works were created. There might not be subject to US copyright law. So those are other things that we need to keep in mind. So that it depends answer is definitely going to apply for a lot of things here for sure. I'm afraid so. It's it, like I say, it's a very it's a very sticky sort of thing to do to to be kind of a, you really can't be absolute about any of this stuff. Here's a more general question that came in. Someone typed in that they weren't allowed to upload a movie that they purchased into their course. Why aren't online educators subject to some of the same rules as face to face teachers are in terms of copyright? I, I um, that's a that's that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I 
I think, I mean, there's, there's any number of reasons that we could talk about um, that we could surmise. Um, I think the, you know, I think the motion picture lobby is pretty, is pretty strong. One of the things I frequently tell my teachers that come to me for guidance and help with things like this is that because of the nature of an online course, we're almost under a microscope. So Disney's corporate lawyers are not going to be likely to be sitting in in classes, whereas they might be scanning through our, our online classes and thinking, hmm, where are some areas that we could generate some revenue? So that's definitely one area to keep in mind just the fact that our online materials are widespread and are widely available. So they're more subject to being found out and thought out, for sure. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, I, you know, one of the things that's, that's really important, I think, too, is uh, particularly if you're at an institution that has a learning management system that's behind a, a firewall and a, and, and a password for students to, um, only, only students enrolled in your course have access to, is one way of sort of protecting yourself from, from being totally out there in public. Um, but that still doesn't justify some things, I think. Absolutely. And again, we are going to get that caveat that we're not lawyers. We're not entirely sure about some things, but maybe I could ask you a few questions that came in that are a little bit more specific, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Okay. So one question that we had came in that I was kind of curious about. If I, as an instructor, took a photo and used that in my online classroom, could my U.S. university use that photo in their model classrooms without asking for my permission or without giving me attribution? It uh, kind of depends. <laughs> Here we go. It depends, I think. Um, and again, once again, I have no legal background whatsoever. But my, my feeling would be um, it kind of depends on what your arrangement is with your institution. Um, if you have, I mean, it's kind of like the YouTube license. You know, you've, you've agreed to participate in this YouTube thing, which basically means that, people, that YouTube can do what it wants to with your stuff. Uh, you may have an agreement with your institution that says your institution can do what it wants to with your stuff. I don't know how prevalent it is these days, but there was a time when uh, courses that were designed at particular institutions actually were the property of that institution and not of the designer. Um, one of the things that we didn't mention in terms of the copyright um, law is that um, if you're hired to create uh, work, um, that work then is something called work for hire. And you, even though you created it, you were paid to do that. And the, the organization that paid you is actually the owner of the copyright. So, so that may apply to some institutions where you're hired to create a course and it's part of your contract to create a course, and therefore everything that you create belongs to the institution. That's a really good point. And furthermore, it's very important to make sure that as you're going through and signing on and agreeing to do different projects for your employer to read all that fine print and see who owns what in terms of copyright and creative licenses. So that's a really good point. Yeah. You brought up YouTube, and we had a really good question that came in. When I share out a link to a YouTube video, let's say I share out a link to a video that's posted in my class. Now, let's assume that this video does have a violation of U.S. copyright law. Where do we draw the line between the responsibility of the person who actually posted it, the responsibility of YouTube, and the responsibility of the teacher who shared that link? Uh, what do you think? <laughs> I'm going to take a wild guess and say it depends. Yeah, I, I, I think it depends. I mean, you, you basically, it's, for a while, you know, we were living in sort of the Wild West. And, and if, it was very easy to, to, you know, for an instructor to say, you know what, it's out there, it's free, it's usable, let's, let's use it. And, and I think we need to be a little bit more responsible, um, not only for ourselves, but also for what we're modeling to our students. So that, so that we model good behavior of, um, of resource material, uh, the use of resource material. 
um, and and not and not model kind of um, kind of an uh, underground sort of um, approach to using material that's out there. I, mean, I think that's really important that that students that students particularly. I mean. 17, 18, 19 year old students, you know, think they can do do anything they want to. Um, and part of what we're doing in education is kind of educating them as to what it means to use resources. So even if something, I, we didn't mention this either, just, uh, just briefly, um, even if something is in the public domain or something is freely available, um, it's really good practice to tell people where you got that from. So it's not, I mean, basically, um, if you want to put off some, put out somebody else's work as your own, we're talking about something different, and that's something that um, I mean, we're, we're talking about plagiarism, which is is um, is a is a problem. It's not something we want to encourage. Uh, that's a totally different issue, but but basically. Um, you know, I, again, back to that issue of, you know, what do you want? What do you want your students to gain from this? Is it just is it just access to this material, or do they need to learn how to become responsible internet citizens? Definitely, good digital citizenship is a really important part of teaching online. And as instructors, we need to be practicing what we preach and setting fantastic examples for our students. So that's a really good point to bring up for sure. If Folks have specific questions about copyright or copyright issues. Are there any other resources you could point them to? The website you shared with us is fantastic. That's a good way so we can sort of use that tool to reflect, is this fair use or is this maybe something that would violate copyright law? Do you have any other resources that you might want to recommend? Well, one of the, one of the best resources are the people on your own campus. Um, you know, the, the, the legal counsel uh, on your campus, your librarians will know uh, quite a bit about that. I just shared the, the library resources from here at the University of Minnesota. There are any number of those out that are out there that, that help you kind of walk through what fair use is. And I would say just do an internet search for fair use and you'll find all kinds of wonderful materials that, that help you kind of walk through what that might mean. That definitely is helpful and librarians are also fantastic resources. So I would definitely want to point anyone with questions about copyright fair use to a librarian. They'd be able to help with that for sure. And just in case you don't have access to a full legal team at your institution. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's, there's, there are, there are, um, let's say the legal team at an institution, there are institutions that, that the, the legal team might simply say, you know what, uh, you can't use anything you haven't created, just because we don't want to put ourselves in that position of being sued. Um, on the other hand, most, um, I think I think a lot of a lot of uh, advisors, let's say, um, particularly librarians, um, would have an opinion about whether or not you can uh, use a particular resource. But they're gonna they're gonna pretty much ask you to decide. You know, unless unless that opinion is you know we can't it, it would really impact our institution if you did this, and it's and it's a very public sort of thing. Um, but if it's a matter of again using a song from a from a um, uh, CD, um, that's a choice that they're probably going to ask you to make. Definitely, and that's a really good point that we as educators need to make our own judgment calls at times. And you touched on something that I think is really important that is, you know, the fear of getting sued. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of a fine line we have to walk as educators where we want to make sure that we're protecting our institutions from lawsuits, but at the same time, we definitely wanna make sure that we are providing a rich experience for our students and making sure that we can give them as much as we can so they can continue to reach their goals and move up that ladder of language proficiency. So that's a really important point that you brought up and I appreciate you bringing that up. What would you say to teachers who, you know, maybe are in more constricted environments where they have a legal team that says, please don't use outside resources. 
Do you have anything that you would want to suggest to them to try to maybe make their own resources, any words of advice to think about? Um, you know, we have a, a, no, a number of, um, you know, the, I'm looking at, looking at the earlier uh, um, lessons in this, in this course. Uh, many of them are asking students to create materials. Um, gee whiz, what a resource. I mean, kind of work with your students to create materials that can become, that can become resources for future students. Um, th there's, um, you know, find, find speakers of the language that are local to you and ask them for interviews. Um, do, you know, whenever you're traveling, take your camera with you. I mean, just, just the, um, um, the, 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 the public sphere is really, uh, is really open to you and you can do all kinds of, you know, you can gather all kinds of materials that are telling and that are, and that are culturally authentic. Um, you know, that picture of the Wiener schnitzel, for example, I mean, I, how many, it's a, it's a, it's a typical story. It was, a, you know, when, when Twitter first came out, that's all anybody ever did was take pictures of their meals that they were having. But, um, but why not? I mean, if, if this is something that is different, uh, and culturally authentic, um, why not take pictures of very common, um, common items, and that becomes a really good resource to talk about or to make available to your students. Not to mention that it's also a great way to build those connections with their students. When you're sharing your own personal experiences and your photos and your stories, you're making those connections with your online students and really creating a more meaningful experience for them. Yeah. So thank you very much for sharing that. We are just about out of time. I do want to remind everybody to please take the survey that was posted in the chats so we can get a little bit of feedback on the presentation. Dan, this was fantastic. And again, a topic that a lot of online educators really appreciate hearing more about. So thank, thank you for sharing your stories and your expertise with us. We yeah, really I, hope I, I hope I haven't just muddied the waters, but... Uh... But it's it's one of those things that you know it, people need to talk about and, and need to work through with each other. Absolutely. So thank you for giving us more food for thought. 